Julia Davis speaking. Uh, her books, The Honey Bee Inside Out and uh, The Honey Bee uh, Around the Bout, or I've used them myself on the on the intermediate and senior exams here for FIPCA. It's a little bit different from the UK exams, but um, they they really are good, and they give us give a huge amount of information. Anyway, today she's talking to us, and uh, I'll just hand it over to you, Celia. Thank you. Okay, I will attempt to share my screen. Okay, I'll go silent. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Right, is that all right for everybody? I uh, hope you can all see it and you can all hear me. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's very nice to be with you all, although I'm not with you all in the flesh, so to speak. Um, and there are so many people from so far away as well. Uh, it is really quite humbling to realise that you're all tuning in just to listen to me. I, I hope you find that it's worthwhile. Now, this talk is called The Roles of Summer and Winter Bees. And of course, to the casual observer, a bee is a bee. And uh, winter bees and summer bees look alike. And um, there's apparently no real difference between them. Um, but in fact, if people ask us the difference, we say, well, the summer bees live for five to six weeks, whereas the winter bees live for seven, up to seven months. But there is, of course, a lot more to it than that. Well, there really has to be, doesn't there, if I'm going to talk to you for the best part of an hour about it. And um, it's quite an interesting topic to explore, in fact. Now, in this talk, I'm going to look at the functions of summer and winter bees. We'll look at summer bees first, and then we'll look at the winter bees. Uh, I'm going to look at the differences between the two groups of workers, which are really quite profound. How these differences are brought about, as far as we know at the moment anyway, and how we can protect the winter bees because that is very important. Those um, winter bees, I consider, are the most important group of workers in the colony, um, because the ability of your colony to survive the winter and get started in the spring depends upon those winter bees. And without them, you don't have a colony the next year. Right, now you are all very well aware of the annual colony cycle. Normal one, um, just go through it quickly in case we've got any new beekeepers here. Um, you've got this period in the um, spring where the colony is growing very rapidly and building up to swarm. It wants to reproduce, so it swarms. You then lose a lot of the bees from the colony and there's a bit of sort of a period of retrenchment before the new queen starts to lay and her brood starts to hatch. Um, so that basically is the life cycle. The, um, the problem time is down here. And February and March are the difficult months. This is critical in the life of the colony. And they do, if they're going to die, that's when they die. I don't much like doing this um, talk at that time of year, because it's very depressing for people. And I say, well, your colony is there at the moment, so let's hope it does start to turn uphill. Um, now, if we look at the different kinds of bee in the hive uh, for a moment, um, here we've got yellow representing the summer bees, blue representing the winter bees, and green is where there is an overlap. Um, and, um, we can see that obviously in the winter there are all winter bees and nothing else and in the summer there are all summer bees but there are these periods in the spring and the autumn where there is an overlap and there are some summer and winter bees present at the same time. Um, it is important to realise that although we use this as an annual cycle, it is an annual cycle uh, represented by growth, reproduction and then, then working towards surviving the winter. Of course, the colony theoretically is a perennial colony which goes on from year to year. 
although all the individuals change, the queen can change, or well, she does if they, they swarm, of course, it, it's still a perennial colony. Now let's just look at these, um, some of these then first of all. Well, when a bee emerges from its cell, it's fully developed um, from the external point of view. And there'll be no more changes uh, apparent to it, uh, apart from the fact that it, it loses all that nice downy fur that it has when it first hatches out and becomes a bit careworn. Um, but apart from that, uh, the external part of it and its basic structure remains the same. But what isn't fully developed is its glandular system. And that is very, very important. And we will look at that um, in a few moments. Now, the aims of summer bees are quite simple, and I think we're all aware of them, really. It's to build a colony up in the spring so that it can swarm. Once it gets up to sort of 30, 40,000 bees, then it wants to split in two to reproduce. And that is a natural um, process. It's what all colonies really should do once a year. I know that's a bit of a depressing thought, but they should. Um, they also have to collect sufficient food that for their immediate needs. The natural food of honeybees and other bees is nectar, nectar and pollen. Um, and when you've got a huge number of bees and larvae in a hive, um, you need to collect enough food to feed them all. And it's quite an immense task. They also have to collect and process sufficient food for winter stores, because although those stores go on being accumulated later in the year, it's the summer period when most of them are actually produced, as we're all well aware. So the summer one, uh, the summer bee is, has a life of activity. You can see here that there are bees that are uh, leaving the hive. There are ones, this is taken a so sort of just after lunch when the young bees are out having their orientation flights, um, they collect nectar uh, and pollen, as we can see, and they swarm. So that is basically their life. And of course, their lives are small, are short, and they're only going to live for about five weeks, six weeks if they're lucky. Um, they just work themselves to death. Now, the... Um, different jobs that a worker bee does follow normally in a fairly set pattern, although it's, it's not casting tablets of stone at all. When it first emerges, it starts cleaning cells um, and it eats pollen. As it gets a bit older, it carries on eating pollen until when it's probably a couple of weeks old at least, so it still eats some after that. Uh, and it's feeding the brood and the queen because it is turning that pollen into brood food. Uh, that is most important really, as we'll, we'll see to the whole sort of success of the thing. It then uh, builds comb if there's a need for comb to be built and comb will generally only be built in response to a need, either a need for more space for storage of stores or for the queen to lay in but those slightly older bees will be able to build comb there and, and uh, we'll see the reasons why in a minute. And then as they progress, they will process nectar. Um, and then finally, they will start on outside jobs until they die. And once they actually move outside the hive, then um, it is a sort of slippery slope to death and they don't last all that much longer. Now, it is important to stress that these jobs can, these, these times can change. They're only approximate. I loathe exam questions that ask people to state the ages at which bees do particular jobs, because we all learn them, we all write them down. Um, most of the books have got slightly different numbers, and it, it, it's really only approximate anyway. And of course, bees can change uh, their habits so that in some circumstances, younger bees can become foragers. That means they will die earlier, but they can become foragers if that's what the colony needs. And in fact, older bees can revert back to brood rearing. They won't be so good at it, but they will 
revert back to brew drink if that is required. So it is a flexible system and it's important to realize that. Now the glandular system is linked to this and um, it's one of the uh, ways in which this is controlled. When a bee first emerges, um, its glandular system is more or less undeveloped. Uh, the glands are all there, but they're not actually functioning. And the first glands that develop are the hypopharyngeal and the mandibular glands, which are found in the head of the worker bee. And they produce brood food. Hence that young bee up to a couple of weeks old feeds brood, feeds the queen, feeds immature drones for the first week or so of their lives. Um, and so that, that, that brood food is, is essential. After that, the wax glands develop to enable them to make wax, clearly to make comb. And then the hypopharyngeal glands, which have now um, somewhat atrophied, they're not as, as big as they were, they start producing enzymes. Now, clearly this corresponds to the period when the bees are processing um, nectar and turning it into honey. The enzymes, which are sucrase or inverte, same thing, and glucose oxidase are the two enzymes that actually act on um, sucrose in the case of sucrase and, and glucose oxidase on glucose. And um, they are very important, of course, in the process of turning nectar into honey. The mandibular glands also change. They no longer produce um, a part of the brood food. They produce this substance to heptanone, which we've always described as a pheromone, an alarm pheromone, which repels um, robbers particularly. It's not such a strong alarm pheromone as the sting pheromones, but it does repel um, robbers. We now know that it actually functions as an anesthetic. Um, so that it's uh, only a short term anesthetic, so it sort of knocks them out, um, which is quite a good way of getting rid of them, I suppose, because then you can again cart them off somewhere if you're talking about um, wasps or other bees. And then the venom sac and the sting glands, which obviously the venom sac contains a venom um, and the uh, sting glands produce, well, the, the, the whole sting apparatus produces pheromones, the alarm pheromones that we're all too well aware of. Um, <clears throat> these have been developing from when the bee was quite young, um, a bee, less than four days old can't sting. Uh, it's just not developed sufficiently, but these gradually develop and they reach their peak when bees become quite uh, old. And this is why, one of the reasons why you can sometimes get a sting which doesn't seem to have any effect at all. And other times you can get a sting which is really a bit of a nuisance. Um, and it's often because of the physiological condition of the bee uh, and the age of it. So um, those develop, and also the Nazanov gland, which has been developed earlier, but that becomes of prime importance. Um, that produces the Nazanov pheromone. Some people describe that as the come hither pheromone, which can attract um, bees back to the colony, can attract queens back after their mating flights. It's important in the swarming process, um, but of course in the swarming process, many of the bees are young bees. But the, it is important in um, older bees because the foragers are the ones that really organize the swarm, um, get it moved to the right place and so on. And Nazanoff pheromone is, um, assists in that, although the, the queen pheromones are important as well. So those are the, um, the glands that develop over time and enable the bees to do these different jobs at different ages. If you just look at those for a minute, this is the, um, this is the, the face of the bee with the face taken off, if you understand. Um, so if you look into the face of the bee, you will see these two huge glands, which are the hypopharyngeal glands. And there's also, you can see the mandibular gland there, there are two, there should be one this side, but that one had an argument with the scalpel. Um, so it's a bit collapsed, but this one is, is nice and round on top of the mandible, there's the mandible. 
Um, so those are the two brood food glands and they each produce um, a component of brood food. Uh, hypovaryngeal gland producing uh, a proteinaceous food and the fats being produced by the mandibular gland. And then there's the wax glands. I'm sorry, I haven't got a nice picture of wax, um, wax scales being exuded from wax glands. So I've put in some arrows to show where they are. Um, this is the underside of the bee and the wax glands are produced there uh, in the wax glands, uh, pushed out through the, um, through the wax mirrors and into the outside, little transparent flakes, which are then of course molded into comb. And then finally, the Nazanov gland, which again is arrowed there, the raises its body and, and bends the abdomen over and it exposes that canal, which gives off Nazanov scent. I haven't put the sting in because I think we all know where the sting is. Um, so that's not too great a problem. Now, pollen is of enormous importance. It's pollen which drives the development of the bee. And pollen is the source of protein, fats, vitamins, and minerals. Now, we're all aware, of course, that all babies, uh, whatever species they are, need a good balanced food. And bee larvae are no different. And of course, they grow very, very fast so they need lots and lots of protein. Um, a bit of fat, the fat is essential. They do need some fats. Fats make up, there's, there's a part, there's a um, constituent, fat constituent in all the cell membranes that are produced. So when you've got an, an animal growing very rapidly, new cells being produced all the time, all those cell membranes will uh, incorporate uh, fatty substances. Um, and uh, you also need fats to spin the cocoon and without fats larvae will not develop properly and in fact they will die eventually before they reach adulthood obviously not before they reach the pupil stage in fact. and of course you need vitamins and minerals in small amounts but they are still essential now you might say well where's the carbohydrate well of course the main source of carbohydrate is the nectar uh, which contains sugar and uh, contains a few other bits and pieces of things, but not very much. There is a small amount of carbohydrate in pollen as well, but it's not considered very important. The um, protein content of pollen uh, needs to be, in use is about 20%. Um, but, and, and the fat is about 5%. It, it varies quite a lot. And it is important that there are mixed pollens. You saw in that previous slide that there were several colors. Um, there was blue, there was a yellow, there was a, an orange, and there was a greeny one. Um, and it is important because pollens are not all the same. Some are better than others. You're all aware of dandelion pollen, which is a, a good source in the early spring. One of the earlier ones that bees really work hard. Um, if you've got many around you, and most places have got plenty of dandelions. But the pollen is not terribly good. It's got a couple of, of, of amino acids, which we'll talk about in a minute, missing from it. So it's not very good. So they need other things as well. So if we look at the protein then, protein, they, they need a lot. Um, 30 plus, that's quite a conservative estimate, I think. And again, it's, it's very approximate. Um, you know, you think of the number and, and guess it really. Uh, it's a lot of pollen. When you consider that the, a bee carrying both legs loaded with pollen will be carrying between 15 and 20 milligrams. Now, I always say to people, um, when I quote these figures, I say, you can you can sit there, if you find the rest of the lecture boring, you can sit there and work out how many pollen load makes up 30 or 40 kilograms. Um, and it's quite a lot. Uh, so it is, and it is very, very important. Now, they need that variety of pollens, as I say, and they need that variety of pollens because pollen, uh, proteins are built up from amino acids. 
Amino acids uh, are strange things. They all contain nitrogen, which is really not all that important. And there are, in fact, there are 22 of them. And all the proteins in the whole of the living world can, are made up from amino acids. Now, obviously the proteins are different. Um, some of the proteins in your body are different to the proteins in your bees' bodies. I mean, some of them are actually the same, but um, quite a few of them are different. And they are different because they are built up from different combinations and different numbers of amino acids. So when a, a bee eats protein or, or has some of this pollen, it digests the um, protein and it, in, inside its, um, its, its um, ventriculars and it breaks down the pollen into the proteins rather into amino acids. Those amino acids are then absorbed into the, into the hemolymph and taken to whatever they wanted and then they're built up again into different proteins. Um, and there are 10 that are called essential amino acids which the bee is unable to make. It can actually transfer the relevant um, amino group uh, from one to the other for some of the amino acids, but for 10 of them, it has to take them in, in the complete form that they are in, uh, contained obviously in the proteins. They're the same 10 essential amino acids as we need. And most other animals, in fact, need the same 10 essential amino acids and not all pollens contain them. So I mentioned dandelion, sunflowers, another one. They, they have some of them missing, only one or two, but they have some. But there are some um, pollens that are very, very good. Um, some of the Boraginaceae, uh, Vipers bugloss. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Vipers bugloss. Um, Vipers bugloss, borage, these kinds of things, the pollen is very, very good. Oil seed rape, the pollen is very good in that it contains all the essential amino acids and it also contains, um, in each case, more than 20% um, protein. Um, some pollens are very poor uh, and particularly the wind pollinated pollens, which fair enough, they, they you know, do not interact with insects normally, but they still collect them sometimes. I can't remember the figures now, but Maize is one thing which bees do quite often collect. Uh, I've watched them collecting pollen from it, but it is quite poor actually in protein content. So it isn't as all that simple. It's not just the case of collecting any sort of pollen. Um, they need the right pollens. And if we look at what happens to pollen in the summer bee, it's eaten by those young bees as we've seen and it's built up into body protein. And much of that protein is the form of vitalogenin. Now, different people pronounce it in different ways. That's how I pronounce it. Um, but, um, you know, that's what it is anyway. Long name, very important substance. And we'll talk about it a bit in detail in a few minutes. And then that body protein um, enables the brood food glands to develop and start producing brood food. And that brood food is fed to the larvae, the queen in the form of royal jellies and young drones. And, and each of those has slightly different mixes, um, depending on, on obviously the, the, the sex and the age and so on. And they also um, provide a small amount for the foragers. Um, and I mean, foragers don't need much in the way of, of um, protein that they still need a little bit. And they're given a bit of this brood food, providing there's enough to go around. If there isn't enough, if there's not a lot of sort of surplus brood food, then the foragers don't get any. And this acts as a um, feedback mechanism because if they don't get any, then they go out and they're more inclined to collect pollen to bring back to, so that more brood food is produced. So, um, it, it's, it's really a matter of processing the pollen via the young bees. They process it all for the rest of the colony. Right, now that gets us to the winter then. Now we don't see many scenes like this anymore. Um, this was taken a few years ago, um, well, quite a few years ago actually. 
And um, I can't remember the last time I saw snow like this. But the winter bees, are there all snug in their hives, we hope. Um, and they have different names of the summer bees. So the aims of the winter bees is to store large amounts of food in their fat bodies during the autumn. Then they've got to survive the winter. They've got to care for the queen. And they've got to feed and care for new brood late in the winter. When the queen starts to lay about January time, um, obviously there will be new brood to feed and take care of. And then they kickstart the colony in effect into growth in the spring, as we saw on the graph earlier on, um, before the uh, new bees are in sufficient numbers to take over. So very, very important. Um, and the life of the winter bee is really quite different to the life of the summer bee. I think we, we all know that. Because as temperatures fall, it forms part of a cluster. And um, that cluster feeds from honey store, the honey store, uh, to provide enough um, energy for heat production. Then as the queen starts to lay, it begins to feed brood, as we've seen, and it converts the protein stores in its body to brood food as the brood increases. And this is something that's important to realize. Most of the protein store in the hive during the winter is actually stored in the bodies of the bees. Um, and uh, although we like to see um, big uh, walls of pollen when we put our bees to bed in the autumn, which is, is good, uh, and they can feed from that, but it does lose some of its uh, nutritional value over the winter period. So that store in the bees' bodies is very, very important. And then they may actually forage on early spring flowers because, um, you know, if, you, if you've got um, things like uh, snowdrops and crocuses out very early in the year, it will probably be the winter bees that will be going out to collect that, um, particularly the pollen, um, because that's what they're after, fresh pollen at that stage. Now, if we look at the cluster, um, for a moment, because the cluster is very important to winter survival. Um, it's made up of two parts, of course. It's made up of a, an inner core where the bees can move about um, and a dense outer mantle. And these two parts have quite separate functions. Um, it's been likened to the, um, the emperor penguins in Antarctica. You, you've all, I expect, seen um, pictures of these emperor penguins, well, films of them um, on television. Uh, you know, some of you might even have been to Antarctica and seen them in, in real life, although I don't know. Um, where they huddle together, this is just the males, of course, looking after their eggs. And uh, again, you've got a, a, an outer mantle protecting an inner core, and the outer mantle and the same thing is happening in the bees, they all face inwards and they pack tightly together. Now, of course, in the case of the bees, they're covered in, in fur, in hairs, and those interlock and they form a, a, an insulating layer. The bees in the middle, I've probably got some headings here. They, oh, no, I haven't really. The bees in the middle actually move about and they feed on the honey that they stored during the summer. Um, and that honey produces energy, which enables them to um, keep warm. To, they can, they can uh, disconnect their wings from the muscles, the big wing muscles in the thorax, and vibrate those muscles to produce heat. And that's much the same as, as you shivering. Now the bees start to um, form small huddles. They just clump together in, in groups at about 15 degrees Celsius. And then, I mean, there is, I've seen some figures which say the cluster is at its tightest at minus 10 degrees C, it's certainly tight at minus 10, um, but it's probably pretty tight at, at naught degrees C. And then we've already been through that, and the inner core generates heat. The one thing I didn't say was the core and the mantle bees exchange places, and the, um, 
you know, because it wouldn't really be it'd be good enough if the poor old mantle bees, who obviously get quite cold, um, are always stuck on the outside. So they do swap over. And if you look at, at cluster temperatures, it depends whether there is brood or not. And if, if it's broodless, the temperature in the core is around about 20 degrees Celsius. Whereas once there's brood present, it has to be raised to 34.5 degrees Celsius. Um, now that of course takes more energy. And this is why, uh, another reason why bees die in the um, early part of the year, why they starve, because once there is brood to feed, the temperature has to be raised. So they have to consume more honey in order to keep their temperature up. And um, that, of course, can, can lead to a depletion of the stores. And uh, if there isn't enough, then they will all starve. And then um, the outer bees, the ones in the mantle, can fall just about down to just over eight degrees Celsius. And anything down at eight and below, the bees will actually die. And at uh, about five, 5.5 degrees C, they go into um, a coma. And even if they are sort of revived from it, they will die anyway, that once they've gone into that state, they won't survive. So um, I don't know whether you've seen, when there has been snow on the ground, like that first picture I showed, they often bees will fly out because the snow's got sun on it and they think it's bright and they'll fly out and they'll circle around and fall to the ground in the snow. And uh, I mean, if you find bees like that, you can often pick them up and they seem to come round again. But those bees will in fact die um, in time. So if we look at the use of pollen by the winter bees, it's quite um, different to the uh, use of pollen by the summer bees. Well, not quite different, but the different in some ways. It's eaten again by the young bees. So when those winter bees hatch out from their cells, then it's, it, they eat pollen. But instead of converting it into brood food, this time they store it in their fat bodies. And mainly, of course, in the, in the form of vitalogenin again. This keeps the bees young and extends uh, their lives. Um, and we, we will talk a bit more about that in a moment or two, but it is, it is a says, very important substance. And um, they don't work, of course, they don't feed, feed brood. Their metabolic rate is in fact slower they're not as active at all so they are quite quite different in the way that they are built and then they use that to produce brood food in the spring um, and once they've depleted it then of course they age very rapidly and die now this is a picture which i've stolen and i i confess i've stolen it because i haven't got one anywhere near as good as this um, which shows you the difference in the fat bodies. I do think it's a shame that fat bodies are called fat bodies because body suggests a, a solid um, structure. And of course the fat body isn't a solid structure. The bee on the left um, is a forager. The bee on the right uh, is either a nurse or a winter bee, I don't know which. And this is from Keller, which was in 2005, this photograph was taken. Um, and, um, you can see in the, in the one on the left, there really isn't anything in the way of a fat body, whereas the one in the right, it, it's, it's quite extensive. And the fat body is really loose aggregations of cells, they're white cells, and they're just um, all over the abdomen, lining the abdomen, um, top and bottom. And um, in a, in a, this, this would be a very nice if it were winter bee lots and lots of um, fat body cells containing lots of um, particularly protein but some fats and um, glycogen as well so that it's got all this store of food inside it um, they're sometimes re referred to as fat bees um, but um, that's the difference between them and that that is of prime importance now if we look at vitalogenin um, which we've talked about quite a bit. It's a very complex uh, substance. It's actually what is officially called a glycolipoprotein, which means it contains some carbohydrate, some fat, and a lot of protein. It's pretty well universal in all higher animals. Um, and 
its composition is different, varies slightly the, the composition of the, of the molecule. And it contains roughly 91% of protein and about 2% of carbohydrate and around about 7% of fat, but that is variable. And it really began life as, um, in, 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 well, in most animals, it is um, a precursor of the yolk that's in eggs. But of course, in the case of the worker bee, the worker bee doesn't produce eggs. So it's been um, adapted for various other functions. And it is actually the key to winter survival. There's a lot of work being done on this by Dr. Gro Amdam, if you want to look up um, her work and find out some of the things that, um, that she's discovered uh, in her work there. So um, it's produced in the fat bodies. And that's another point I want to stress is that fat bodies are not just storage organs, but they're factories for the production of substances. And they, many metabolic processes go on there. Things are broken down, things are built up. Um, it's also very important in the um, immune system, uh, building up various proteins, which are important in that. So it's, it's um, a very important substance this, and the fat bodies themselves are also vital. Um, so it is the main protein in the bees bodies and it extends the life of worker bees. So you can see why those, that forager wasn't gonna live very long, an important part of the immune system. And it also works in combination with hormones. You see, this is what I said about winter and summer bees, although they seem to be simple, they're not. Um, and there's quite a lot involved in it. The two hormones that are really uh, fundamental are juvenile hormone, normally abbreviated as JH, and egg disone. Egg disone isn't one hormone, in fact, it's a, it's a group of hormones, but generally just called egg disone to simplify things. Um, now, there was some work done uh, by these people, Bartok, Bitondi, and Simos. Um, showing how these interacted. And in the late pupa, you have low ecdysone and a slight increase in juvenile hormone, which induces phytologin in production, CG's phytologin, because you can't keep writing phytologin in it's too, too long. And then in the young adult worker, you have low levels of juvenile hormone a high protein intake, and that increases your vitalogenin. So there is an a, um, interaction between juvenile hormone and vitalogenin. And it always seems somewhat counterintuitive that in the young adult bee, juvenile hormone levels are low, uh, whereas in the older adult bee, those are high. So it's the opposite way around to which you would expect. And of course, the two, juvenile hormone and vitalogenin, are in fact antagonistic. So as uh, juvenile hormones drop, um, so they're low, the vitalogenin is high and vice versa. When the levels of juvenile hormones start to increase, then the vitalogenin falls. So it's quite a complex story really. And I, and I don't think we've got um, all the detail that, um, that is there yet, but it, it's, it's, it's a very interesting one. Now, the house bees have low juvenile hormone then, high vitalogen, and they remain young. So that is the winter situation. In the summer, of course, those house bees will only be in that state for perhaps three weeks. Um, and then the, the juvenile hormone uh, starts to increase, vitalogen goes down, and they age very rapidly. Um, it is important that they, as they age, they don't have lots of vitalogenin inside them because of course that's the main protein store and you really don't want a lot of the colony's protein disappearing off into the blue yonder and then dying somewhere out in a field. So it is important that they don't take lots of food with them. The foragers then have increasing juvenile hormone very low vitalogenin, and that leads to their aging and their death. So you can see that's the sort of um, really the uh, 
the difference, the, the, the fundamental difference between these two types of bees, the summer bees and the winter bees. Um, now, protecting our winter bees, that is really, really important. The winter bees, of course, which I should have said, have probably um, evolved because of the bees' ability to store vitalogen in. Um, it isn't a trait that's found in tropical bees, apparently, where you don't have a winter period. Um, so if a colony happens on hard times, then it just tends to abscond. Um, but by having this substance which they can store and which they can tap into later, that enables them to survive the, the winter period. Right, so protecting our winter bees. Now, as this is the most important cohort in the hive, we've got to make sure that they are fully protected um, before we shut them up for the winter. Now, late summer food is important. Um, the winter bees start to be produced from eggs laid um, in early August. And um, so that the winter bees will, you know, the larvae are growing during August. And um, the summer bees that are there will be bringing in lots of food so that when those bees emerge, they've got lots of, of pollen that they can eat. So things like um, the aster at the top, also known as Michaelmas daisy, of course, heather, ivy, and Himalayan balsam. Um, these are all important late sources, and there are others as well, but uh, these are probably the main ones. So lots of nectar, lots of pollen, lots of food. And of course, as beekeepers, if our bees are short of food, then we, we have to top that up for them and ensure that they don't uh, starve. And they need lots of um, stored honey, which, uh, or sugar syrup if we're going to take all the honey off, of course, and um, those are, are, are there over the brood nest usually. Low levels of varroa. Now, a bee infested with varroa as a pupa can't produce as much vitalogenin as a healthy bee. So that's the first problem. The other problem, of course, is the viruses and um, any bee basically that has any disease is really um, going to have a shorter life. Now this can affect the summer bees because clearly if they only lose a day or two in the summer, it's going to have quite a profound effect if it affects a lot of bees. Uh, and then in the winter, of course, if their lives are reduced, they won't survive. So they'll die, so they won't survive till the spring. The other problem is no sema. And here I put arrows by a, a couple of the spores. There's, there's not an awful lot of spores on there, but there, there are some. Um, no sema is this sort of almost silent killer, really. And many people who've, whose bees are, are suffering from no sema don't actually realize that their bees are suffering from no sema. You can see this is a microscope photograph taken at 400 times magnification. And of course, that is really the only way of diagnosing nosema. Now, the time to look for nosema is in the spring, not in the autumn. If you look, at it in the, look for it in the autumn and find it, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it except worry all winter that your bees have got it and they might not survive. But look for it in the spring, and then if you find it, then you can do a belly comb change or change your comb from, for, by some other method. So get them onto clean comb, which is one of the best ways of combating it. There are no chemical treatments for it, um, but uh, clean comb and good nutrition. Good nutrition is important in all these things. Um, it never ceases to amaze me that beekeepers are mostly aware that they need good nutrition but they don't always regard it as of prime importance for their bees, but of course it is. Now, SEMA, of course, is a gut parasite, and um, it appears that the spores can coat the cells of the ventriculus, the cells that line the ventriculus, and it is the, these cells that produce the digestive enzymes that digest the pollen, the protein. So, they will not be able to digest their food as well, uh, and that will lead to nutritional deficiency. 
So again, it will affect their ability to produce um, glycologenin and um, it will uh, mean that they will die sooner. Any disease will shorten the life of the bee. So, you know, anything at all. My one hive is currently, I was talking to Brendan earlier before the rest of you joined, um, has currently got B, chronic bee paralysis this virus. Um, there's absolutely nothing I can do about it. I'm, I'm quite worried about it because at this time of the year, of course, there are not a huge number of bees dying, but there are some. And that's going to, to really reduce the size of the cluster. And bigger clusters survive much better than smaller clusters. Um, they don't have to work so hard individually. And also, of course, there's this normal um, situation that um, this relationship between volume and surface area um, and a small volume loses with, with, with a small surface area loses more heat in relation to a bigger one. So that is, is quite bad news um, for that colony. I should be interested to see if it survives, but um, we will see. Right, so in summary then, summer bees are all about growth, maximum food collection and swarming. That is their raison d'etre, that's what they want to do. Winter bees are concerned with survival and just the initial spring growth. And winter bees must be healthy and well fed. Plentiful mixed pollen is the key to brood production and to winter survival, we'll come to that as well. Vitalogenin is an extremely important substance in the life of the bee and has all sorts of different effects. And winter bees need large amounts of late summer and autumn pollen, which can be processed in the, in the hive and um, can be turned into uh, the storage products in the fat bodies. And that concludes the talk. Um, I hope you have found something of interest there. You haven't all gone to sleep. That's the trouble with this kind of um, lecturing. You can't actually see if everybody's fallen, fallen asleep. Of course, you might all have left by now. I don't know, really, because I can't tell that either. But thank you very much for listening anyway, providing you're still there. Uh, and I hope you've enjoyed it and maybe learned one or two things. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so we have a, a bunch I'm of questions. Finished. Oh dear. Um, okay, let's start at the top. Yeah. What, what are the main detrimental effects of varroa mites on the winter bees? Well, as I said, it, it prevents the bees from making um, the same amount of vitalogenin, so that's quite serious. But of course, the main effect of varroa for any bees really is the viruses that it transmits. The varroa itself, I mean, I think in the, in the very early days, some of you might remember, I, I, I've been around for a long time, uh, when, when varroa first appeared. Um, and I remember Steve Martin was one of the earliest workers in this country, and he was down in, in Devon working on them, and he got some hives down there, which had got enormous quantities of varroa in them, actually massive quantities of varroa in them. And they, they were still doing all right. It wasn't, seemed, didn't seem to be bothering them too much. And he couldn't really understand why Varroa was such a problem. But then, of course, once the viruses got really going, then that was the real problem. And as I said, any disease, whatever it is, shortens the life of the bee. Obviously, if you've got something like, or the bee has got something like chronic bee paralysis virus, it will, it will kill it soon. That isn't associated with Varroa, of course. But if you've got deformed wing virus, that will also shorten the lives quite drastically and, and of course make the bees rather um, ill and not able to work. So uh, all these things will contribute and Varroa is still, I think, the commonest cause for winter losses. Um, there are other causes, but um, I mean, starvation is one, but starvation really is inexcusable. No colony should die from starvation, but um, if they're cared for, but Varroa is still the major um, destroyer of colonies and it must be controlled. And of course you must control it before your winter bees start being produced because uh, Varroa will attack the pupae and um, the pupae will, will not be able to, to survive until spring. So that is the problem 
with grower. Several problems, in fact. <laughs> the next one is, does ivy pollen contain the 10 required amino acids, particularly the essential amino acids? I don't positively know the answer to that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay. Um, you can look it up. You, you, if, you, if you look it up on a search, you, you'll find it somewhere. But uh, I personally can't remember. I, I have seen that figure, but I don't know. OK. Is there a pollen substitute that contains all the uh, required amino acids? Yeah, the pollen substitutes are um, supposed to. Um, I always get questions about pollen substitutes. I've tried pollen substitutes, I must admit, because, because I used to get lots of questions about them at talks. I, Start. I thought, well, I'll try them. I'll, I'll, I'll have a go because I've never used them. Um, it's a few years ago now. And um, I tried them on, obviously, I, I've never had a huge number of colonies. I had 14 at the most. And I tried them on, on some colonies and not others. I personally didn't see any great difference. But then I've never been in an area that's particularly short of pollen. Um, if you are, then they might be worth trying. And they could be worth trying in the spring to promote growth, which is when a lot of people use them, or in the autumn to help with your winter bees with, with their protein intake. There's a lot of discussion about um, pollen supplements, um, substitutes and supplements. I mean, obviously a, a supplement is something which contains pollen, certainly a percentage, perhaps not a big percentage. Pollen substitutes don't contain any pollen at all. They can contain things like um, soya flour, uh, brewer's yeast, um, egg albumin, milk powder, things like that. All protein substances, but not pollen. Um, it's interesting, I mean, in the States, and I know we've got some people in the States on here tonight, so I better be careful what I'm saying. Um, but in the States, of course, where uh, a lot of people take their, commercial beekeepers take their bees down to the almond orchards in February, they have to get their colonies ready very early. And in that case, they tend to use pollen substitutes in a routine manner to boost those colonies early and get them big enough. But um, in this country, unless I think you live in a completely um, arable area where it, it's a sort of arable desert, if you like, I think there's very few parts of the UK where you would have problems with a shortage of pollen. Um, and pollen is the best natural food for bees, obviously, uh, not a substitute, uh, which is basically artificial. So, yeah. <laughs> Actually, just to comment on that, I noticed today that the gorse has started to flower. So yeah, yeah. we're going to have pollen available all through winter. Well, gorse is always in flower. I mean, the saying goes, when gorse is out of flower, then kissing's out of fashion. So, yeah. Well, well around here, it seems to stop for a couple of months. Does it? Yeah. Oh, well, that says something, doesn't it? We won't go into that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, to what extent is the production of winter bees affected by race and location? Some of my hives stop brood rearing by the end of August. She's in New Yorkshire but still get through winter versus other colonies I hear about that rear brood well into the autumn and winter. Yeah, um, I haven't a lot of experience of different subspecies of bees. Um, my only experience really is because is, all my bees have always been ordinary mongrel bees that I've reared myself. But um, in our branch apiary a few years ago, we, we had well, quite a few years ago now, it's probably about 20 years ago, we had an apiary manager who brought in some Italian queens. Um, now, of course, Italian queens are very, very popular worldwide and very prolific queens. Um, they were very prolific. They were lovely and they were beautiful to handle. I mean, there were lots of advantages to them. But when we came to feed them in the autumn, they didn't want to know, really. They, they just wanted to produce more and more brood. And I think this is one of the things um, they obviously come from a warmer area than our native bees. And I mean, many of you in Ireland are very keen on your native bees, I know, because you've got big populations of them over there. Um, and they have evolved to be more hardy, to overwinter on um, probably sort of smaller amounts of stores and so on, and to shut down their rearing earlier so that they do survive much better. I mean, we did get these Italians through the winter, um, 
we wish later on we hadn't because when they they reared when they crossed out they became extremely bad tempered um, they all had to be requeened <laughs> a couple of years later but um that was another story but yes i think the uh, i have no experience of other subspecies because i've never used them i don't don't import queens or get queens from other places um but it, it's obviously going to be a difference because the the subspecies evolved in their own habitats in their own environmental conditions um it's interesting I, i'm talking actually to um i don't know how many of you know marina nastasov uh, he comes from bulgaria and um he, he prominent in the bb he was chairman of the bbk examinations board at the moment he um he was saying a few weeks ago something i hadn't thought about people always say carniolans are very um prone to swarm and which is is true i think i've never had them so i don't know but everybody says they do uh, but his parents live in the hills in bulgaria and um they keep bees and they keep carniolans and they are adapted for life in that part of the world very short season so they have to build up and get going and swarm because otherwise they don't get a chance well of course bring them to a warmer climate such as ours in this case and then they they seem to be very prolific swarmers so it's it's each subspecies is adapted for its own environment and um i think we should remember that they evolved in that way and i i don't personally i don't think it's advisable to move um a different subspecies about and of course colos now has quite definitely come out they did some quite sort of far-flung research and said the best bee is always your local bee wherever you are doesn't matter where you are and um leave the the others to their own situations um will the for foragers know which amino acids they're short of and therefore go find the relevant pollen now that's an interesting one that's a really interesting question whoever sent that in um I was reading a paper a little while ago where they, an experiment had been done where they had deprived, um, these were caged bees, a group of bees um, of one particular uh, amino acid. I think it was tryptophan, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure as so I'm talking from memory now and the old memory is not so good these days. Um, they deprived them of this one amino acid uh, for a period of time. And then when they, um, after that period of time, I can't remember how long it was, they then gave them groups of them different diets. And um, some carried on with the diet that they were on and others they gave um, a, a diet. Well, they, they gave them a choice of diets basically. Uh, and one of those diets contained the um, amino acid that they were missing in quite large quantities. Uh, and um, the one was a complete mix of all of them all just all right and the other one was still a deprived one that they'd been on. And they picked the one that had got the large quantity of the amino acid that was missing. So they have some way of balancing their intake, um, but we don't know how. <laughs> so if somebody asks how they do it, we don't know. But they obviously, uh, well, from this particular piece of work, they seem to be able to balance the amino acids, which is, possibly why you might find some bees I, I don't know I've got a photo, one photograph of a bee working a dandelion flower on the edge of a, an oilseed rape field all its mates were in the oilseed rape field but <laughs> well, most of them were but this this one bee was there working dandelion and it may be that some of them always will work something different just to bring in different pollen although in that case of course the dandelion's poor and the oilseed rape's much better but you know they they go for variety by and large and it's why one of the reasons why bees on large monocultures can suffer somewhat uh, because they're not getting that mix of pollens we don't get many of those around you know in, in the uk anyway let me know when when you've had enough questions there are plenty, plenty oh, okay. yeah. um <laughs> i don't know what the time is oh we're all right yeah the night is yet young yeah <laughs> what triggers the development of winter bees is it just the reduction in any egg laying um i'm not sure of the answers to that i mean 
what triggers the changes in most um, animals is day length. So whether that is the um, it's day length, it's availability of forage, these kinds of things um, must be the trigger, I think. Uh, but I'm not I, I haven't got any proof of that. I haven't sort of read anything that says what it is. Um, so I can't say that definitively, but I, I would suspect it's partly day length, it's partly um, availability of forage, because as the forage diminishes, so of course the egg laying diminishes, uh, we're all aware of that. Um, and, um, and then they, they begin to sort of wind down towards um, winter, and of course the temperatures drop as well. So I think it's probably a combination of things. Um. With the easy availability, in, uh, availability of insulation, should we insulate hives to save the bees' hardships? Um, it's a good point, and many people do. And uh, of course, in colder countries, uh, it, it's common practice uh, to put some sort of wrapping around bees. Um, and I think it is probably a good idea. Um, bees living in a, in a tree, for example, usually have a much thicker outer covering around them of wood than they would living in a in a normal beehive. Um, so yes, and, and clearly anything which will keep that hive a little bit warmer is going to save the bees energy um, and mean they'll perhaps overwinter on less uh, stores and be able to start into life earlier in the in the year. Um, of course, bearing in mind if they do start into life earlier in the year, then they're going to need more food to get going. Because uh, so that that's something else to bear in mind if you, you are insulating your hives. But yes, I I can see that it could be a very good idea. Okay, uh, could we have the reference for the work on choice of pollen with higher higher lower amino acids? No, I couldn't because I haven't got it here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, Let's see. Does day length stimulate winter bee production? I think you well, we just discussed that. Yeah, possibly. Okay. Do the young bees metabolize pollen directly, or must it first be uh, processed as bee bread? Um, they can consume fresh pollen, but it does seem that mostly it's via bee bread. Um, but they certainly can consume the fresh pollen as well, because the bee bread is slightly different because it's undergone this lactic acid fermentation um, in the hive, and which is supposed to uh, increase its, well, its keeping capacity, but also its nutritional value. So bee bread is probably the commonest way that they obtain their, their protein. Um, back to the pollen substitute. What are the benefits of any pollen substitute? When would you give it? I think, oh, I think we already covered that actually earlier on. Yeah. Um, what's your view of stripping hives of honey at the end of the season and feeding sugar syrup to feed the bees from a nutritional perspective? I don't think it makes much difference, to be honest. Um, bees, natural food, obviously, is the honey. But um, honey basically is sugar and water. It, the, the, there's, there's about, I think it's in nectar, there's about 3% of, of other substances, which are a variety of things. Um, but the bee doesn't derive much benefit from those as long as it's got a good supply of pollen, which will provide them, them anyway. Um, so personally, I, I don't think it's anything to worry about. And they seem to work perfectly well on sugar syrup um, without any problem. Okay. Um... If you fed a bee in the summer with lots of pollen and didn't let it fly, would it develop the same physiology as a winter? <laughs> An interesting experiment. I really don't know. I don't think anybody's tried that. <laughs> I don't know. You can't, I mean, you know, you, bees that, that don't have to feed brood, if you take all the brood out, then that will prolong their lives because they don't have to feed brood. So they, they do build up their, their fat bodies and they, they are like winter bees, but you'd have to take all the brood out. Um, and I don't know why you'd want to do that, uh, but um, other than to find out. But yeah, that, I think that's how you do it. I, 
you'd, you'd have to remove the brood. I don't think you could um, just shut them up and <laughs> stop them flying. Yeah. <laughs> um, in your experience over winter, what supplements have you found to be beneficial? Fondant or candipollin gold or apipasta? Well, I have, as I say, I have no great, so no great advantage from using pollen substitutes. I've got some in the garage now. Um, it's probably out of date, in fact. Um, but the only time I feed fondant is I, I generally overwinter um, some nukes uh, as an insurance policy, partly to keep, you know, spare queens and so on. And I always feed those after Christmas with fondant because. Um, you can't, if it's a strong five frame nuke, you can't get enough food into it to last for the winter. Um, obviously, if any colonies need feeding in the winter, then you need to feed fondant. You can't feed syrup at that time of the year. Um, but um, my view is, and it's always been my view, that the bee's natural uh, instinct is to store sufficient food in the summer and autumn period to last through the winter. And that is what you should aim for. So that any food that they, extra food they need should be fed in the autumn um, or and the end of the summer, whatever, but that time of year, so that they can store it away and they've got their stores there in the hive and they don't have to be disturbed or fed fondant or anything else. Because of course, fondant does require some liquid in order to utilize it. Um, and all right, they, they, they get a certain amount of condensation in the hive from, from their breathing, um, but they will, if they need to, they will use sort of body uh, water to um, dilute it. So I do think, you know, they're, they're better off without, I mean, lots of people these days seem to automatically feed fondant later in the winter. Whereas when I started beekeeping, this was a very unusual thing to do. Maybe beekeepers these days are wealthier than beekeepers were when I started beekeeping. You know, in those days, every penny counted sort of thing for most beekeepers. But um, no, I, I think it's important that they have sufficient in the autumn to get through the winter uh, without worrying about it. That's my view. As far as pollen supplements, I say I've, I've not had any real experience of pollen substitutes all, other than a small amount, which, and I, I don't think it actually made any difference to my bees at all. Um. Would you suggest using a uh, supplement of winter feed, for example, hive alive? Never used it, so I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> why do foragers need brood food? What are the main proteins uses uh, by foragers? Most well, they still need to make um, enzymes, which are protein substances in their bodies, and they're probably a very small amount of repair um, to any damage. So they just need a small amount of, of protein, really. They don't need a lot but they need a small amount to keep them going. So particularly the enzymes. Enzymes need to be produced um, because all the, um, all the processes that go on, all the chemical reactions that go on in a, in a body of any sort, a bee's body or our bodies, require enzymes. Each, each reaction requires an enzyme. Um, so, you know, you, you've got to keep a small supply of protein going. Although they're not growing, obviously, like the younger bees are, the younger larvae and so on. Yeah, so they still need a little bit. Are warmer winters affecting winter bees by making them more active? Quite possibly, because they do, of course, the cluster, which I, I didn't say, but I should have done. The cluster, as we all know, breaks um, and, and opens up. as the, I mean, it, it, it contracts and expands according to the temperature. Um, and clearly if it's if it's expanding and coming outside and i've seen bees on um flowers in in january new year's day christmas day uh, in the last few years they'll come out at any time um that is using up energy um and that energy has to be replaced with something that means that they are um needing more stores so yes it's going to have a, a probably a detrimental effect on them on the other hand, it does enable them to go on cleansing flights, which is advantageous. But um, yeah, it, it, it may, as far as the food condition, the, the food situation is concerned, it, it may very well um, lead to problems. But I, 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 that, that is really the only problem it's likely to lead to, I think. Okay. 
Um, I live in Dublin. Most of the bees are still bringing in pollen. Mm. That's ivy. Uh, do they stop gathering when the temperature drops lower, or would they continue uh, if the temperature remains around eight degrees? Well, this is it. They'll, they'll, as long as it's warm enough to go out, they'll go out, and if there's something there, they'll collect it. Um, I mean, I've seen them collecting stuff off Mahonia in January um, in, in my garden. Um, as you say, they collect ivy, you know, as long as there's some out, they'll go and collect it. Uh, but they, because when the temperature drops, then they start clustering. And once they're in a cluster, then they, they don't go out. But then when it warms up, of course, that cluster expands again and then they can go out again. So it, it just depends on the temperature, really, uh, and whether there's anything when they get out there to, get, to collect. As long as there is something to collect then, then, and they find it, they will bring it back. What are your thoughts on supplemental feeding and pollen substitutes in the autumn to build up the talent? I think you've... Well, we've covered that pretty well, yes, yeah. Uh, how many different pollens do bees tend to collect in summer? Oh, apparently, in most cases, they will restrict themselves to about four at any one time. But they won't collect a bit from here, a bit from there, but, you know, they, they will restrict themselves to some extent. But, I mean, over the course of a summer, they can collect any number of different pollens. It just depends what's in the neighbourhood. I mean, it, it's a really, it's a very interesting part of beekeeping, I think, um, walking around your, your area and knowing what plants are out at different times and seeing what the bees are working and looking to see what pollens are coming in. We conducted quite an interesting little um, trial at our apiary in, in, um, in our branch apiary one year. We decided to um, collect the pollens that the bees were bringing in because it, it, you got mesh floor so you can put the drawer underneath and, and collect the pollen loads that drop. And um, we recorded them each day. We, we were in a, at that time, we had the apiary in a park, an, an urban park. So we used to go and have a look around the park and see what was in flower. And then look at um, Bill Kirk's book, uh, a pollen identification to look at the um, colors of the pollen. And, you know, you can make an educated guess at what the bees are actually bringing in doing it. And it we kept a list all through the summer and it was really quite interesting to see the number of things that did come in. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not an easy thing to do because most pollens are in the range of yellow to orange. <laughs> it's quite exciting when you get something a really different colour that you can identify positively. Um, I've always grown for Celia, which is, um, I don't know whether you're all aware of it, it's actually a green manure technically speaking, but if you leave it to flower, it, it flowers very quickly and it, it's, uh, it has these lovely blue flowers and lovely blue pollen. So you can really identify bees, everything loves it. It's, it's actually fantastic. Um, and all the talks I do to gardening clubs and things, I, I get them all growing. Well, I hope they all go away and grow for Celia after they've been to my talks, um, because it is one of the best um, plants that there is for bees and hoverflies and butterflies and moths and, and everything. Um, and uh, yeah, lovely blue pollen. So, yes. Um, what colour pollen uh, do they collect? What colour pollen? Yeah. Whatever colour it is. A lot of it is yellow or orange, but there are red pollens. Horse chestnut is bright red. Uh, pop poppy is black. Um, I say Phacelia is blue. Um, what else? Well, I don't know. And, and there's, oh, um, oh, can't remember the name of it now. The um, hmm, Philip Pendula, but I can't remember its English name. Uh, that's a light green. Um, there's, there's lots of different colours of pollens. Um, the grey ones, the rose bay willow herb is a sort of greyish colour. Um, Heather is sort of whitish sort of colour, isn't it? Sort of whitish, greyish. There's all sorts of different colours. Um, it's just a case of get, get, get a pollen book. I say Bill Kirk's book on pollen colours is quite good. Um, there's also Dorothy Hodge's book, of course, if you can get hold of one and afford the price. But um, that, that's good as well. So you can identify them very often from the colour with a bit of sort of, say, background work to see what is actually out. But, um, and of course, if you've got a crop out like um, 
I talk a crop loosely, so I talk about uh, several horse chestnuts or, you know, um, quite a bit of um, pussy willow in the spring, for example. I mean, it's yellow, but you can be fairly certain it's pussy willow. If there's lots and lots of it coming in, um, you know, that's coming from pussy willow. It, it's, it's just a matter of being um, using some common sense and perhaps a book and just keeping your eyes open and looking. It's interesting. Somebody commented that the philopendula is actually meadowsweet. Meadowsweet, that's the word. Yes, thank you very much. I couldn't remember the English name. <laughs> um, I think we should, we'll need to end this at some point. Yeah, anyway. indeed, because it's 10 to 9 now. <laughs> yeah, you must be getting tired. Anyway, give, give two more questions. Okay. Everybody says that honey is far better for the bees than syrup for winter food. Intuitively, it feels like it should be, but is there any evidence? To confirm this or is it an all wise tale? Not as far as I know there isn't any evidence, no, um, but there may be some somewhere. But it is, I mean again the purists, the natural beekeepers and people like that all swear by honey and yes you can say well honey is their natural food so maybe it is better for them but I don't think there's any evidence to that, no. Okay, um, uh, do you overwinter on a mesh floor? Some old hives, uh, cottages, Sorry, I'm not sure what, what that is. I uh, used, uh, used to have a five inch mesh hole that could be killed as well. Mm. I overwinter on mesh floors. Um, I've not had any problems. Of course, you, you get much less condensation than you used to. You know, in the old days, you, you could get quite a bit of condensation in the hives, which was never very good because bees don't like damp. Um, if you want to, if you feel that it's, it's sort of cold and you've got winds whipping across, uh, we're in a very windy situation here, actually, but I, I put up a windbreak in front of the hives to keep the wind off, and it's quite sheltered there now. Um, you can put, um, what you can do is put an empty super under the hive so that the, you know, it's got a skirt in effect around it so that it's not um, exposed, so exposed. But yes, I overwinter on mesh floors, and I've done it now for, I don't know how many years, since we started using mesh floors, I think. And uh, with no um, ill effects, as far as I'm aware. Do you put some the people say, sorry, I was going to say, some people say the bees start breeding a bit later in the spring if they're on mesh floors. I don't know. Oh. I haven't noticed do that. Put, do you put the mesh, the uh, insert in? No. Okay. I put it in occasionally to monitor, okay. um, but I don't put it in to keep it in. No, no, I leave it out. They're open. Okay. Um, so I, I think there, there are still, uh, uh, you know, seven <laughs> questions left. So I, I just leave it because they still trickle in, like, and I don't. I was just to say, one thing I just just add there, Brendan. I yeah. overwinter with a mesh floor which is open, but I do put insulation on top of the hive. Oh, yeah. So I always insulate under the roof, um, so that it's it's insulated up there. Yeah. That's it. Sorry, could have added that. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, I think, uh, you know, going by the comments, everybody enjoyed it. Good. Uh, I really do appreciate you coming along and talking to us this evening. Okay. Well, I haven't come very far. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Right. Um, so, good. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Um, uh, good, good evening and, uh, you know, stay, stay safe. Bye.